Welcome everybody to Lightning Talks at day two. Uh, the first talk has been cancelled apparently because Mattis is not here. If we will appear later, we'll have his talk afterwards. Anyway, we'll start now with Florian Burkhardt talking about open source and pandemic influenza. We only have six talks today, so I'll give him about six or seven minutes. I'll tell you one minute before the end that you should hurry a bit. So go on. Excellent. Hello. Um, well, my name is Florian Burkhardt, and I would like to talk the next five minutes about the common success strategies of um, open source software and um, well, you see, pandemic influenza, and it does seem like a um, far stretch, and it is a far stretch, but uh, it's a great way to catch attention, and um, it also illustrates um, common principle in um, both uh, worlds, meat space and cyberspace, because in both worlds we encounter similar problems, and when we have similar problems, we usually have similar solutions. And in cyberspace, you have the challenge to write code, write good code, and to make it uh, more and more uh, efficient, and also to optimize your code. And one solution has been that you um, start sharing your code with the um, with the open source community. And by doing that, you basically say, uh, or you share your code, and you give away your well intellectual property, and you ask others to improve on that so that the end result is, um, is more than, than, than its part and it's better suited to, to solve your problems. And in the biological world, you have a similar problem. Every organism has its genetic code and you are constantly under, um, you find yourself, or the organisms find themselves under constant changing um, environmental conditions and now, not looking at the individual organism, but looking at the whole species over time, uh, you need to ensure that your offspring, or your, I don't know, 100th generation offspring, 100th generation offspring, um, has the same survival chances. And um, evolution came up with a quite good tool for doing this, and it's um, sexual reproduction, where you basically change large chunks of your genome, you exchange it with each other, and this um, should be seen opposed to the normal uh, genetic mutation that occurs. Because here you really exchange large parts and large chunks of your genome. And even bacteria have sexual reproduction. Viruses do not have it per se, but they have different mechanisms invented to make sure that they don't only rely on the genetic drift. Genetic drift would be the very slow accumulation of uh, mutations. But they also have uh, methods which allow them to exchange whole parts of their genome at once. And I randomly picked a virus, which just happened to be the influenza A virus, which was also in the press as um, the avian influenza or the um, Vogelgrippe. And um, influenza is a quite a bit big challenge to public health because it has the very nasty um, property that you are infectious before you note that you are infected. So before you become sick, you have the opportunity to infect, well, basically everybody you meet. And all the normal uh, methods for containing an uh, epidemic, like quarantine or, or isolation, what, what they did, for example, with SARS, they just don't work because you do not know or sick people are not recognized. Then, like all viruses, excuse me, um, it has a very high mutation rate. This essentially means that you do not care how many uh, junk offspring you produce as long as there is one offspring which has um, changed its genes so much that it is more um, successful in invading, for example, our next organism. We could not afford this high mutation rate. We would simply die of cancer. And something that is really nasty uh, with influenza is that it has a segmented genome. And I will come to this point, to this segmentation later. Um, the next real problem is that it has a very broad host range. Um, usually if you get infected by something, you are the, or only your species can get infected by this because there's a very high specialization uh, of the pathogens and the hosts. But here you can have different uh, hosts. You can have a bird, like the little duck. You could have the little piggy. And of course, you can also have humans. 
Now, um, what happens is that in each of those species, you have a very normal um, genetic drift. You have s mutations coming up and just accumulating, but they all stay in the same organism. They all stay in the duck. They all stay in the little piggy or in the human. However, when you have a situation where all three come together, and this is the case with uh, a lot of farmers in rural China, and it probably was the case in, in Europe um, 100 years ago, then you have, um, and, and they actually live very close together, um, and, and they are in very close contact. Then you have the situation that your formally separated viruses can exchange their information. Um, this, of course, refers only to the influenza A virus, so you can't have random viruses exchanging information with random viruses. Florian, it's last minute. Okay. Um, so, the idea is that co-chairing of a whole um, genome segments leads to this newly arranged, really, really dangerous uh, virus. And right now we are at the situation of 2005. This is up here. We have avian influenza. And what everybody is afraid of is that something like this, this rearrangement could happen. And the prediction is that it will happen anywhere um, in the next 10 or 20 years, or within the next, well, 10 or 15 years. So I'll just, I, I skip this. You can download it from the wiki. It just says the same. So the summary is that code sharing is quite a very old, um, tested and very proven uh, strategy in evolution to optimize your biological or digital program code. And uh, well, yeah, this was it. <laughs> OK, thank you. Okay, and the next talk is done by Joel, by Jens Olig about Jabber on mobile devices. Oops. Yeah, thank you. I have not prepared any slides because I think it would be overkill for five minutes. I just want to give you an idea. You all have, I guess, mobile devices like uh, cell phones, and they get smarter and smarter every day, and uh, nowadays uh, we also have a new phenomenon, instant messaging. Probably most of you have ICQ accounts or use uh, OWL instant messenger or whatever. But of course there's a better solution for that for geeks, which is the Jabba protocol, which is an open protocol. Uh, it's an ROC internet standard, and um, you um, basically you use uh, XML um, things to exchange message messages. You can do a lot more than just chatting and, and see who's online. And um, yeah, basically instant messaging has evolved uh, to be something like the missing link between email communication and a telephone call. A telephone call has uh, the disadvantages that you play this tag game with people, like you give them a call and then they are not there and you try it again and they are not there and then they try to call you but you are out for lunch. Um, so there's uh, a problem to see when they are online, so to say. Email is another problem, you send off an email and um, depending on the person and their discipline to check their email boxes, it can take maybe days for them to re respond. So instant messaging really fills this gap that you can have instant communication and also can exchange uh, electronic data like with email. And um, more and more people use this for businesses and Jabber, of course, because it's not property, because it's not owned by one company and you d can anyone can set up a Jabber server is the ideal thing for that. Now, wouldn't it be great to have that on your mobile phone? There are already ideas how to do that and there is also source code available on the internet uh, for mobile phone Jabber clients, but I think up to now we have not seen the ideal solution and we have not seen an integration of that Jabber client into a web interface, for instance. There's a great web interface called uh, JW Chat, which is uh, done by some guy from Berlin and um, basically brings Jabber to your desktop, to your browser. And now what we need is uh, bring Jabber to your mobile phone and stop using this annoying SMS thing. Um, we've been working on that. Uh, and on commercially, we've reviewed uh, quite a few Jabber servers and quite a few 
you know, uh, parts, open source parts, how to put them together and how to have a really round product. Um, it's not ready yet, but uh, we've already registered the domain name, of course, because that's the first thing that you do. Um, we call this Mabber, Mabber.com, M-A-B-B-E-R.com. And uh, if you look at it now, you can, well, enter your email address and you will get notified when we will start, which will be in the very soon f future. I don't want to make promises, but it's going to be awesome. And um, if you want to have a look at it, um, well, we can have a talk afterwards. Uh, CCC people would be, of course, yeah, very welcome as beta testers. It will be commercial after some time, but it will be built out of open source blocks, building blocks. For instance, we reviewed a lot of Java servers to um, get the job done. We wrote a lot of uh, code for a nice web front end, and of course, there's a very classy uh, Java-based mobile phone client that you can use. And um, I hope that for the first time we have put together the right building blocks and I just wanted to point you to that internet address, meva.com. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. I just subscribed to your newsletter. I hope you won't spam it. Uh, well, anyway, the next talk is done by Philip Drössler about post-structured journalism. Is Philip here in the room? Actually, yes. Oh, cool. Okay, so just go on and... Have fun. Um, if you look at the wiki of this conference, there's a list of blogs that report about this conference. It is about three pages long. Since about six years, weblogs have turned from something that people don't do to something people just do. And we now have podcasts and video blogs in addition to that. And many people use blogs as a digital diary or a way to rant about their lives. But there are people who want to do more than that, who want to do actual journalistic content with digital media. There are groups like the Gothamist and Metroblogs, which have planet-spanning networks that do such things, but they encounter two problems. The one thing is, if you remember the terrorist attacks in London or the earthquakes and in Pakistan or the ever natural disaster in the last year, uh, the old media, newspapers, television, radio, actually turn to bloggers for information because bloggers have the benefit of not being confined in a deep structure, not having to ask for money, guidance, allowance by their supervisors, by whoever they work for, so they can get there fast. They can get the information when it happens, not when they get allowed to get it. But uh, since most bloggers aren't structured, they just have their domain and their little blog system, we don't get the credit. It's just, oh, nice, it's the bloggers. Look, they wrote something. We can use it. Hey, hi, bloggers. That's not very <clears throat> good. And the other thing is, uh, a journalist has many problems. If they work for a conservative newspaper, they can't write, and they find out that the conservative presidential candidate has sexual tendencies towards goats, they can't write about it because it would be against the line of the media they work for. A blogger can do this. And they will do it if they are at least a bit honest. But there's a magic word. And the thing that distributes a blogger from an actual journalist is accreditation. If you're accredited with a newspaper or a TV station or a radio station, you get a nice little piece of plastic saying press journalist. And you can go around and wave it around. And people just talk to you. They give you answers. They give you information, resources. You can go to press conferences. Bloggers can't do this. Because what, what do you want? It doesn't work right now. And where I come from in Austria, since about uh, six months, there's been a law in effect that forces bloggers to note their name, their address, and contact information on their web blog to give up their privacy because uh, the Constitutional Court ruled that web blogs equal journalistic content. But another law states that unless you get paid for being a journalist, which most, most bloggers don't because who would pay themselves, they can't get accredited as a press reference. So we get all the blame and all the responsibility, but none of the good stuff. And it's much worse in other places. For example, if you live in the Middle East in some non-democratic country, you can get beheaded for operating a blog. It's been, it's, it happened, or in the Southeast, in Asia. But 
as a journalist, you have a specific safety layer above that. If somebody arrests you, if somebody hassles you, you can say, wait a second, I'm a free journalist. You can't do that to me. Bloggers can't do that. So the thing is, bloggers have a huge chance to create actual content that is not limited by who they work for or what they're assigned to right now. If you're a sports journalist and you're happening about this great political story, chances are you won't be able to do it because you're a sports journalist. There are no sports bloggers. Well, there are sports bloggers, but they're not confined to that. The other thing is, let's say you're a really good photographer and you come across this big oil leak next to a refinery in the middle of a city and you make a great photo about it, but you can't write for shit. Then you just have the photo and you can put it on Flickr or somewhere, but it's just a picture and nobody will say, okay, what was that about? On the other hand, if you're a great writer, but you don't own a camera or are, unable, are unable to operate it, you see the same oil leak and you say, oh man, I gotta write about this. But people come across your weblog and see what, all this text and no picture, and no videos and no bells and whistles, what, why should I read this? So the other thing we can do that old media can't do is we could cooperate. We could say, hey, I can photograph, you can write, let's do this together. But except for some networks like Gothamist or the Metroblox or others, this isn't done yet. So the reason why I have a lightning talk and an actual talk is because I have all these nice things to say but no solutions right now. Um, one thing that I think definitely needs to be done is uh, we need to find a way to get the rights that journalists have if we have the responsibilities that journalists have. If we need to denote, I wrote this, I can be contacted this way. If you want to arrest a Sumi, I'm here then we need to be allowed to do the same things that journalists does. We need to get the protection and the same access to information. This, I think, can only be done through judicial processes, through law. So this means that if anyone here from, the, from something like uh, the FCE or the Quintessence is here, this needs to be done. This is a hot topic because this could essentially change the way that we process information. And the other thing is there's... The Creative Commons license, I think everyone in the room should at least know what this is. No panicked faces, good. Um, it's a license system that's been tried with a law that allows us to share content. What we lack is a platform for that. If I write something and I want a picture, I could go to Flickr or a million other photo systems and type in the keywords that describe what I want to have, but chances are either I won't get what I want or just some crappy downsized version. And even if I find something, it most likely is licensed in a way that I can't use it. So what I propose is A, we need to change the law. This sounds good. And B, there is definitely a need for some kind of open content platform more specific than what you can find via Creative Commons Org at the moment. They have some platforms for music and for videos and for short stories and stuff. But for non-fictional, real content, there's actually nothing around. So I think if there's a crack web coder in here who wants to talk about that, I'm at the Hack Center at the Aquaville Place. Just look for the big white flag with the Apple logo on it. That's it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So the next talk will be about Mud Next Generation, and done by Andreas Krenmeier and some other people. Okay, only Andreas, the other one, uh, not here. Okay, hello, um, I'm Andreas Krenmer, um, and I would like to talk a little bit about Mud and Chi. Um, I think quite a few people know this uh, mail tool Mud for the, well, it's a console uh, mail reader, and it's used by quite a lot of people, um, but the development model is quite closed. So there are a few core developers and uh, they do most of the development. It's, it's mostly, well, a few bug fixes, but no more new features. And there are quite a lot of patches around for a huge number of new features. But the core developers don't want to integrate all those patches because they say it's all bloat. And um, I couldn't really understand that. So I started um, a fork called Mud and Chi, Mud Next Generation. Um, where, um, well, I just integrated all the patches that I found and I found useful. And really, a lot of them are very useful. And, well, then I continue to fix all the annoying bugs that I found. For example, um, I've, I found one annoying. It's, it wasn't really a bug, but it, uh, it was actually a, a bug of another um, 
uh, Miller application in the RFC 2047 encoding. Um, uh, it says there, there uh, shouldn't be any spaces, um, but this mailer put, some, put in some spaces and so um, Matt only showed crap and it was easy to fix. Um, and so I just did that and um, got a, a lot better result. So I did some interoperability uh, improvements and just added all the new features that I wanted to have. And so we got a new, uh, also, um, well, Two new developers joined me and helped fixing all that, but we came to the problem that the code is basically, well, uh, total crap. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's not really structured, it's written in, in C. Um, and when, when you fix something on one place, it is very likely that you break some other feature or whatever, and it's, it's almost untestable. So we decided to rewrite Math and Chi. Um, we decided to do it in C++. Uh, C++. Um, and we decided to to have some some rules to have to in, to ensure a high quality of, of the code. Um, the the first thing is um, yeah, first of all C plus plus. Unfortunately, um, well, a lot of people don't really like C plus plus, so it's quite hard to find new developers. Um, nevertheless, we said um, all the C plus plus code needs to be documented, so you exactly know what that or that module does. Um, and clean interfaces and that, that you uh, really know as a developer where you can um, go and, and uh, just fix things or add new features. Then to ensure that nothing, is bro uh, nothing gets broken when, when you uh, try to add new features, we just decided to uh, add unit tests. That's, well, um, a nice buzzword, and uh, unfortunately, hardly any um, open source project really does uh, unit testing. And it's very, but it's very useful, and you can, um, well, just just uh, keep your program working, and uh, you can. It, it's also very uh, good for refactoring things when you when you uh, think that the, the the structure of your program is is absolutely crap, and then you just run your unit tests. Um, okay, it works, then you rewrite it, then you run your unit test again, oh, it doesn't work, and then you fix uh, as long as the, uh, uh, or uh, until the, the unit tests work again, so you can ensure that certain modules um, do work. And yeah, the, the choice for C++ was that we were able to do some code reuse, so we, we took some part from from the existing MAT and GE code, mm -hmm. so it's not a complete rewrite, but only about 90% of all the uh, code is rewritten. And we're currently in, unfortunately, a very early state, so we don't have any working protocol implementations, but we have, well, um, uh, the core layer, um, and it's, it's all very incomplete, so we're also searching for developers. So if you're interested in working on a, uh, hopefully, great new um, console mail client um, for, well, Unix-like operating systems, then yeah, please join us there. URL is www.matng.org. Okay, that's it from my side. Thank you. Well, uh, Matt and G is located here in the Hex Center, if I remember correctly, too. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> Somehow. Not really, actually. Okay, uh, but uh, nevertheless, the next uh, project should be at least uh, be located in the Hex Center, pretty close to you. It's a window manager improved talk by Anselm Garbe. Welcome to the window manager improved status report for this year. One moment. No need to hurry. Okay, I see the resolution is uh, very worse. I need uh, 800 pixels, I think I restart. Well, uh, in the meantime, is Matis Mansel uh, now here or should we cancel the talk of him?
Okay, so uh, you're at, there's only one talk after you, so just uh, take your time. Which one is holding this one? Uh, CA cert. Talk about CA cert is uh, the next and last one. Okay, it's still not uh, the best, but we'll try. Okay, what's window manager improved? Window manager improved is a dynamic non-wimp window manager. What does this mean? Um, some of you maybe have visited some talks by me. I already introduced uh, window manager improved and dynamic window management means that you, that not the user manages the windows but the window manager as you see here you have windows are managed in layouts and you got some special functionality to, oh you don't see it, I make it in this window. You have uh, tabbing and uh, layouted clients. You can uh, rearrange all windows without much work. The window manager does it for you or you can do some grid layout as you see here. And yeah, we have a pager as well, a special pager. You see a full screen pager in this window manager. We also got some input menu in the bottom. It's uh, the build is, the picture is cut off, sadly, but uh, yeah. The window manager improved is modernized in several components, especially uh, separate processes uh, bar in the bottom, the menu I showed up, uh, the shortcut handler, when I press some buttons, uh, everything is interpreted by a special application. And uh, the components of Window Manager Improved are communicate about uh, uh, via a file server interface, which is uh, a derived idea from the Plan 9 operating system. I already showed how it works. Um, what's the current stage? I released today the current stable release WMII 2.5 and uh, the dependent 9 base package. The 9 base package contains some Plan 9 uh, userland tools. I ported to Unix and um, the new release is based on this configuration subsystem uh, which is built uh, through the 9 base tools. Uh, the current state, uh, we wanted to achieve full 9P support. If uh, you don't know what 9P is, you can ask me later in the Hack Center or the Plan 9 guys. It's a network transparent file server protocol. And uh, what we also didn't achieve in this release is a new layout interface with column layout based on ideas we found in the ACME programming environment of Plan 9. Well, what's the future? In February, we expect the uh, upcoming WMII 3 release, which will contain this 9P support and which um, will allow us to mount the file system of WMII natively into your file system in Linux if you use a kernel later than 2.6.14. And uh, in the mid of next year, I plan to release the non-WIMP GUI minimalist uh, toolkit called LibLitz, which uh, WMII already ba is based on. Well, if there are questions, you can visit the uh, seat. And uh, if I got a minute still, I can show you what a file system based window manager means. The interface, the window manager is uh, communicates with with each component uh, is a file system and you see if I um, if I, I can uh, access the window manager through this file system and especially I show you a small 
small trick. Uh, look at the bar at the bottom. I can remotely control the bar in the bottom with some commands. Uh, this allows to control the whole window manager through scripts. I have to quote uh, this string. And you see, oh, it was a very short time in the uh, corner, in the right corner, in the, at the bottom, hello audience. Okay, that's it. If you got any questions, uh, visit me in the Hack Center. Thank you. Okay, so let's go on with the last talk of the Lightning Talks today about CASO. Hello, thank you very much for inviting CSRT here. Uh, I'd like to do a short presentation of CSRT. Uh, CSRT is a certification authority from Australia and we're issuing free certificates. That's the basic thing behind it. Um, our strategic goal is to enhance privacy throughout the world and to deliver security for everyone who needs it. Uh, what is a certification authority? We are issuing digital certificates for signing of, of uh, digital things like documents, PDFs, uh, for securing your web servers with HTTPS, for using it with SSL, with uh, TLS, SMIME, whatever you want. And we're also supporting PGP. Um, the applications is you can make, the most people use it for securing their web servers. Uh, it was invented to, to secure the, the web mail behind the, the wireless LANs at home, to exit it from, from, from anywhere else. Uh, CA Cert was started in 2002 and is operating quite nicely nowadays. Uh, the problem until now was that uh, for, for uh, certificates, the identity had to be verified for each certificate itself, which made the price about 200 US dollars up to 4,000 US dollars per certificate per year. Uh, we found a solution. You are, your identity is being verified once, which we are doing here on the, on the Congress, and then you can issue as many certificates as you like whenever you like them for free. Uh, what do we need from you? We have here the forms, which we both have in, in German and in English. My colleagues at the um, exit will, will hand out the forms too. You can come up to our booth on the first floor and uh, come with your uh, governmental issued photo IDs, passport, driver's license, uh, personal ID. And together with the, with the filled in form, uh, be very, your, be, have your verified identity verified from us and then uh, get the necessary points from, for your account. The idea is that you have a web-based account on, our, uh, on the website of CI Cert and we are verifying your identity and issuing uh, trust points on that account and as soon as you have enough trust points from us you can issue the certificates yourself whenever you want. Um, at the moment, there is a free market of about 4,000 assurers doing it worldwide. Here on the Congress, we succeeded to make it for free available. Um, yes, there is a complex point scheme behind it, uh, which has the idea that uh, we have the four eyes principle and that the people can, can learn to do it without doing too much, uh, without being able to do much, too much problems. The account is uh, lifelong, so uh, you can use it whenever you want. Uh, you don't need to get a certificate now. You can get it in 10 years if you don't need it at the moment. But you can be verified now, and uh, so that should help. The certificates themselves are free of charge forever. Uh, the assurance where we verify your identity uh, can cost you something when the assurer asks you for money for it or something else. And here on the Congress it is free. The technology, we have X509 certificates, client certificates, server, cert server certificates, code signing certificates, and open PGP signature, so signatures, so everything you, you, you want. If someone develops a new system, we might also support it soon. Uh, the security, we are currently being included in Nokia 770. 
um, Gentle, Debian, Knopix, Miro S, and a couple of other distributions which I can't all remember. And we are currently being audited by Mozilla. I hope that we will finish it in 2006 to finish the audit and then we will also be included in, uh, with Microsoft and, and all the other vendors. Um, the source code of, of the CA cert platform is we're building on, on standard modules like OpenSSL and GNUPG. And also the source code of our management system is available for uh, review. At the moment we have about 40,000 users out there who are giving a lot of bug reports and everything. We have issued 80,000 certificates until now. We have 4,000 assurers, about 700 of them are in Germany at the moment. Uh, we're in more than 29 countries uh, and the website is translated in about 14 languages. Yes, more information are on www.cacert.org and on wiki.cacert.org. Uh, yes, here are the forms. You can come to me, you can come to the colleagues, and then please, uh, I will invite you here now to, to our booth on the first floor. If you have any questions, feel free to, to contact us. Thank you very much. Okay. And by the way, we are searching for developers. If someone is interested to join our team, we welcome. Okay, that's it. Have a nice Congress. Lightning talks today are over. Bye.